OTAN, Outreach and Technical Assistance Network. Good morning, those of you out there. Um, we're here to talk to you about our experience in adult education in our environment. Um, I don't know how hard it is for students to get into your schools, but it's really hard for students to get into our school. We have really high entrance requirements. <laughs> and it, all, it requires a judge, either appointed or elected, to make a final decision, they're going to go to our school. Our schools are all single staff. Our schools are in gated communities. <laughs> we have 33 campuses. A uniform, strictly enforced. Our students are told what to do, when to do it. They have to be in the rooms at certain times. But the great attendance. So. Our great attendance. So. You would help. <laughs> you would think. You would think. <laughs> Our schools yeah. are also used racist environments on the planet. And it's not a teacher. Students. So clearly, we are with the prison system. We know that from the catalog. My name is Patrick O'Neill. I am an administrator in the Office of Correctional Education, um, the big school district. Um, we call our, that's what we call our school district. I'm here with my team, most of them, of uh, wonderful folks who are passionate about what we do. Our district is actually the largest geographically, largest geographically in the state of California. We are the state of California. Our northernmost school, I don't know where north is, is on the Oregon border. Our southernmost school is Tijuana adjacent. Um, the school structure is just like pretty much any high school you would encounter. Principal, vice principals, we have an art department, we have academic department, we have CTE, we have a testing center, athletic department, counselors, deans, deans of discipline. We call those guys correctional officers saying here you done it. Um, all of our students are convicted felons, but we simply call them students. And some of them actually want to read CJ and Jane Ryan, but they can't. The vast majority of our students come from very broken homes, very tough backgrounds, backgrounds you can't even imagine. When I was teaching transition through the entry course, we were working on filling out a job application. One of the questions on every job application in the country that I'm aware of is social security number. Finally, one of my students said to me, Mr. O'Neill, my mom was sold my when I was born and she needed my time. This is their reality. I want to tell you about one of my first students, his name was Sam. But so we'll call him Sam. He was an energetic 25 year old. This was his second round as a guest of the state of California. And he was eager to get back out, out onto the streets because um, he had a son who needed his guidance. His son turned 13 and started running with a long crowd. Do the math. Sam was 12 when his boy was had. Sam never knew his dad. All he knew of his dad is he was killed in a gang riot at one of the prisons within the system. This is generational poverty. This is generational justice involved. I told you about the Social Security numbers. Most of them, 50% of them don't know it. 85% of our population is either HIV infected or have seen infected. Few of our students even know someone with a history of trauma. This is tough. And yet, we want them to go into the classroom, flip on a computer, and just ignore what's going on in your neighborhood. Just go ignore the battle of gang makers. Let's talk about our educators. 
So most of us that go into education think about oh, I can't wait to sing the ABC song with the kindergarten. <laughs> or watch those fourth graders divide, or have that intellectual discussion with our high schoolers. Imagine you're sitting, you're watching a nuclear family at a dinner, and the soon-to-be college graduate announces, I think I'm gonna get a teacher's credential because I went to teach at San Quentin for Folsom. Grandma's dentures will fly. <laughs> At this announcement, I don't think any of us, maybe somebody over here did. I didn't start my career with the notion of teaching in a prison, even though my dad wanted me to. So I like to tell people that I went from being an administrator of an all girls Catholic school to an all boys boarding school in the gay community. <laughs> That's my reality. One of the other issues we have is because of the state law, our teachers have to have a K-12 credential. We can't hire adult educated teachers. We're working on changing that, but it hasn't happened yet. Our leadership legislature doesn't believe that online learning is real learning. So we can't, can't count those instructional hours. So we have some hurdles. But that's why we're really happy to be part of FEMA, learning what there could be. So I painted this dark, ugly picture. Let me clean it up a little bit for you. <laughs> Our students, they know the metric system better than any other. I have no idea what an ounce is something is. They do. <laughs> they are eager to learn. They're so eager that they will accept a smuggled cell phone so they can watch college videos. That could result in them being in prison six months longer. They have time, they lots of time. They're very good at rationalizing things, at justifying things and convincing people things to do. We get trained how to not fall for their stuff. They are creative. Prisons are the greenest place you will ever see. And I don't mean bushes and trees. Nothing goes un unused. At one point, I saw this little origami critter, this little brown origami critter, the coffee cup. It was amazing. For some weird reason, they have the best penmanship I've ever seen in my life. All of them. All of them. They get a certificate, and we have the ugliest certificates that come out of our computer. They'll trade five or six cup of noodles to be able to send it home. Cup of noodles is money in prison. Because we are committed to reducing the citizens, we endure, we thrive, and we grow in what we do. We know that college or some college drastically reduces the chance of recidivism. But we're not there in terms of technology. Our schools are tender block. Window, what's a window? Have you ever seen a preschool classroom? There's always the toilets kind of out in the open, but in the corner. That's our reality. <laughs> we have to watch our people. Okay. Not fun sometimes. But before I introduce my colleagues, I do want to tell you. The past seven years have been the most rewarding of my career. I have never encountered more um, students who are more ready, willing, and eager to learn and grateful for everything we do. When we have a graduation, the pride on these family members' faces is incredible. And our pay is better than most by about 40%. Just saying. <laughs> so I'm here with my colleagues. Um, two of my teaching colleagues are here. One, we have a video. Another member of our team is from our enterprise um, technology EIS. Enterprise <laughs> and then we have our grand Puba. <laughs> and incredible Dr. Puba Kova.
Okay, so I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Thank you. Who's next? Me? You. We practice this a lot. <laughs> <laughs> practice makes perfect. Uh, my name is John Richards. I'm a correctional educator at Pelican Bay State Prison. Um, I was a public school teacher for roughly 18 years in an alternative setting. And then I uh, ended the program in the public schools. And so then I became, fortunately, a correctional educator in Susanville, California, at a California correctional facility. Um, Mr. O'Neill mentioned that we have 32 institutions. They all have different missions. They're all different levels. They're level one, two, three, and four. Um, you have to get promoted from a one or two to get to a three or four. So not only do you violate on the street, but then you come into a facility and then you get promoted into a more restrictive environment. And even though the public education code called for the least restrictive environment, by the time they get to me in Pelican Bay and Crescent City, uh, of our five yards, four are level four. Uh, two are in addition to level four, they're restricted custody, so they don't get to come out and play with others. We have approximately 1,800 inmates. We call them students, and of the students uh, in our facility, about 800 of them are uh, without a high school uh, completion. So we have ABE1, just like the adult schools. We have ABE2, just like the adult schools. ABE3, like the adult schools. ASE, CTE, then we have college. We have two-year college, and then we have four-year college. What I do is I take them from ABE3 to a high school diploma, um, and I use um, multiple ways for them to get there. My reality is on the five yards in our prison, um, we are basically satellite schools within a single school within a facility. We have an admin that is a hub, and then we have our five yards and our teacher located on all five yards, and we don't see the other teachers day to day. We might see them once a month. So you have four teachers on your yard in my area, one AD, one two, one two three. Then we have a college uh, teacher, and then we have a CTE teacher. We also have a couple of other teachers that have come online in the last couple of years, which Mr. O'Neill talked about, which is transitions. Our entire goal is to re-enter them into society in a pro-social manner. So when I talk about a promotion, uh, going from a one two yard to my yard, they picked up another case, okay? Sounds kind of cool, sounds really cool, but what they did is on the inside, they made either another mistake or they were told by somebody else to do something and they needed to do it, it's their reality. Politics and the gang politics stops at the school's door. They all work together in our facility. Doesn't matter what color, what race, what religion, they will help each other in my classroom. And then they might be enemies out on the yard and then, rinse and repeat. They come back in the next day and they all work together. It's magic to watch these people work together. You then have tutors and clerks that sometimes if a student doesn't pick it up, now realize my students have failed everywhere. They failed in the public schools. They failed in YOP. They failed in the lower school levels. And then they come to me and they say, hey, teach, I'm not very good at this. And I say, look, I'm not very good either. I'd be at Harvard. I'm not. I'm here with you. <laughs> We start laughing. We have an interaction. They like sports. We talk about the Warriors. Most of them are from L.A., so they automatically hate the Warriors. Now we have pro-con essays. Now we have something to talk about. It doesn't matter as we go through discourse versus debate conversations with these people. Once they start talking, they realize they're just like everybody else. They have goals and dreams and hopes. And I tell them, just like... Mr. O'Neill said, if we don't allow them to enter society pro-socially, they're gonna come back. We have to transition them to the outside. 74% if we can get them two years of college don't come back. That's a big number because if they don't get into education, 75% do come back. That's a real problem. So we have lifetime by committee, which is when they come in for five years, 10 different times, we try to stop that cycle. Now we're here for DLAC. We're here for distance learning and technology. We have a plethora of riches. Our, our cup runneth over when it comes to hardware and software. 
they're everywhere. Smart boards, dumb boards, monitors, computers. What we don't have yet, and then we are probably six to 12 months away, is a blended learning model where we can teach, they can learn a little bit before they get there with a laptop. We can give them an assignment, they can come back in and they do have a ton of time. And some of these people want to get out and they want their diplomas and they want to be able to return with a skill. Technology is gonna allow us to do it, but we have to be restricted because of our population, which is what causes most of our issues right now. It's not a lack of, it's the inability for us to be able to use it in a pro-social manner where they're not out getting in trouble doing things with our machines. Our EIS people are working overtime because they have 24 hours a day to figure out how to break it. And these people only work eight to 10 hours a day to figure out how to lock it all down. So they have a two to one advantage over us, but the ones that want to learn, I mean, I've been responsible or near responsible for hundreds of GEDs and high school diplomas. I always say in my, in my <clears throat> last lesson that I did to the inmates before I retire, I'm going to say, I saved, this, I saved the states millions of dollars. It costs $60,000 a year to house these guys. If I can get them on the streets and they don't come back, I save 60 grand a year plus, they get an incentive of six months off to get this high school diploma and a lot more incentivization to finish their college. That is so they don't come back. As a good educator, with our technology available to us, my entire goal every day when I go to work is for them to learn something. We do discipline, not at all. We do classroom management every day, and we teach them individual lessons like, how did that work for you? I don't know. Last time you tried that, this is what happened. Do you think there's going to be a difference? We try to teach them to think that somewhere along the way, they lost that cause and effect, but this distance learning program is going to empower them through some of our Canvas programs to make better choices. If we are successful, we are going to be able to help roughly 105,000 people. Half of that don't have their diploma, and the other part we're trying to get to go through college. Our director of DRP, Brand Show, said anybody without a high school diploma is illiterate. We need to end illiteracy in our correctional facilities. That is what this small group is trying to do. We have a plethora of riches of hardware and software. We need to implement. That is where we're going next for our blended learning. And I think we can do it. And it's just going to take a little bit of time. So thank you for your time. Thank you, John. Our next speaker couldn't be with us today. So he's done things. Hi, I'm Brian Bull, academic teacher for Valley State Adult School. I'm going to introduce you to the role technology plays in our academic environment. Located in Chowchilla, California, Valley State Prison is a level two institution that houses just under 3,000 incarcerated men. Within the walls of ESP lies Valley State Adult School, a campus that covers educational needs from adult basic education classes to career technical education and even a bachelor's degree program through Fresno State. About half of the population attend classes at the school. Here in our ABE classes, students use technology to supplement direct instruction from the teacher. Each classroom contains desktop computers with the appropriate level academic software. AB2 classes utilize Achieve 3000, while the AB3 and GED classes use Aztec software. Our CTE classes work hard to keep up with the advancement of technology outside of these walls. For example, in the electrical program, students have a reference code book to answer technical questions related to their program. These are large paperback reference manuals that trade workers outside of the incarcerated setting house on their laptops. However, the electrical program is piloting an Achieve 3000 math program to help build the foundational skill level of the students. Students in our college courses are issued a laptop for use with their class. Where said college, Fresno State utilized Canvas to post lectures, instructional materials, and to receive homework from their students. These are the first students at the institution to have the opportunity of a blended learning environment. All inmates housed at Valley State Prison also have the ability to access supplemental educational material. Every inmate is issued a tablet that contains an OpenStax library of educational materials and Khan Academy videos that can be accessed for free. These tablets utilize an institution-wide network so these materials can be accessed within the individual's housing unit. 
there has been an incredible change within the technological environment within CDCR in the last few years. But while this is a start, our foundation is far from solidified. One-to-one -one laptop distribution is only occurring with post-secondary students at the current time. Plus, the inmate network isn't accessible in the housing units. College students must take their laptop outside and situate themselves on the far end of the yard to catch the network from nearby buildings. They can be hindered at this access at any time by yard recalls, weather, or any other custody security concern. Teachers have also been tasked with the responsibility of remediating lower level technical support functions, such as enabling accounts and resetting passwords. However, ongoing training is needed to build the capacity of staff, so this becomes a natural process. As you can see, VSP has introduced technology to our population, but ongoing security concerns, training for both the students and staff, the purchase of additional laptops, and the installation of an institution-wide inmate network are all necessary steps we must take to move forward in the process. Hope this gave you some insight to the education in the correctional setting here at VSP and the foundation being laid by CDCR. Hi, I'm Brian. So we started up north, we're in the middle. Now we're gonna go down south. Before, uh, before we move on, a couple of things I do wanna say about Brian's particular case. Um, Valley is what we use 90% of the time to model new things. So if there's something in our system that is out ahead, it likely been tried at Valley. So some of the things he talks about, uh, particularly the information available on those tablets is not widely available in our system. His prison is out ahead. If it works there, then we roll it out elsewhere. Um, but just, I wanted to put that into a little context. Can I ask a question? Do you, the tablets that they're using, um, are they from a certain provider or? Yeah. Hi, my name is Mira Bobbiotella, and I teach at Lancaster State Prison. Um, it's in LA County. And when they're saying, now we're going to go down south, um, what you saw there on the video, I was like, oh, wow, look at all this technology. So I, <laughs> I've only been to CCR for a year. It's my one year anniversary. And I never knew about the education system within this, within the Department of Corrections. And basically I moved and went to the prison because it was close to home. Cause I was commuting two and a half hours one way to a school, a public school where I had been working and I had bought a property and I could only afford a property out yonder, right? So I was driving a lot. And that's when I found out about CECR and I thought, well, let me check that out. And everybody I talked to, they said, I really like it. It's really great. We don't have to deal with parents. <laughs> Okay. So um, I taught AB2, uh, AB3, GED, and I do cyber high. And um, I have taken a group of students from AB2 to GED testing this year because I kind of changed with them, which has been great to see them. Um, when I stepped into my classroom at CDCR, so I am at a level four prison, um, and I have a lot of life without the possibility of parole students. Um, I do have a few that do have some dates for release, um, upcoming maybe in 20 years or 10 years. Um, so we have it divided into yards and I am in what's called B yard. And currently I'm the only teacher there. So it is pretty isolating. Isolated, we are supposed to have three classrooms and um, we have a shortage of teachers. So, I'm teaching um, AB3, GD, and Cyber High currently. When I walked into the classroom, I, I started teaching, I'm dating myself. I started teaching in 1995, and I felt like I had stepped back to 1995 because there was a complete lack of technology in my classroom. Um, I use my whiteboard all the time. And that's basically all I've been using. There is a smart board installed on one of the walls that has never worked because it was supposed to be with a laptop and I only have an old desktop. Um, but the exciting news is that I now, I have six functioning um, desktops in my classroom and I was finally able to, it took about, it took several months to get my password to get myself situated into create student accounts and to teach some of the students how to get on. 
and we still struggle with what's my password? I've forgotten my log on. The difference between capital and lowercase letters. How do you operate a mouse? You know, wait, it's locked. What do I do? You know, so you have to have a lot of one on one um, attention for the students. Um, so we've gotten the six laptop, the six desktops going. Um, they, they use Aztec, they use uh, Achieve 3000, they use the Kaplan. There's some online courses that you can take to prep for. Um, their GED. Um, the good news is, I was told that we're getting laptops next week. So I'll be getting laptops in my classroom. And I'm thinking that how do I get 18 students logged on at the same time when we don't know how to use a keyboard? So they all know how to use smartphones because they all have them, even though they're not supposed to. And if you get caught with a smartphone, that's six more months of incarceration. Um, last week, we finally got our tablets, and it was like Christmas, Hanukkah, Eid, birthday, weddings, everything rolled into one. I have never seen so many happy people at one time, and they love it. And you know what really got me so excited is they came, you're not supposed to bring the tablets into the education, but they smuggled them. They get them in, and then they're sitting in my classroom, and they're like, oh, my God. I can I can study right here. So they weren't even so excited about watching sports or listening to music. They were like, oh my God, there's education stuff on here. You know, so most of my students, um, I have to say, are motivated learners. Um, there are some hardcore guys that will just absolutely refuse to go to education. And you know, I usually go to the housing units and I talked to them, and the funny thing, are we recorded, right? Yeah. Oh, <laughs> the funny thing is somebody cursed at me before and flipped me off and told me to get out of there. He was never going to come to education. But the fact that I went to see him and said, you need to be in class, guess what? He has the best attendance now when he comes. So, um, so they're really, really motivated, and they really want the technology. They all know how to use cell phones, right? But they don't know how to use a keyboard. They don't know how to use a computer, but they really, really want to. And what's exciting for me with the technology being slowly incorporated, so I see it over this whole year span, you know, now when next week I'm supposed to have laptops, that's so exciting, um, is to see the technology being rolled out. And I keep telling them, it's like, look guys, we're working on this blended learning, because they want to go back to their cell and they want to learn more. We have a program, it's called PLMP, where they have tutors. So they've tap, we're tapping into some of the inmates who are further along in their education that can be tutors. And we have some real math wizards on the yard that will sit with my GED students and will tutor them. So they're really excited to be able to use their computer and I shared the plan with my inmates. I said, here is what we're working on. You know, so the plan is you're going to be able to take your laptop and tap into some additional video. Say maybe you didn't understand the math lesson from the day. Well, there's such a thing as Khan Academy. You can go into the videos and watch the videos and further, you know, your education that way or repeat some assignments or do some additional assignments to see your knowledge. And they're super excited about it. Um, you know, the ones that have the possibility to get out, um, you know, they're, they're, they're really focused on, you know, I want to, I want to get my degree, I want to get an accounting degree, or I want to become a barber, or I want to get, you know, like, uh, like an electronics repair person. Um, so they have, they have goals. And one of the things that in education in the prison system, what I really love about it is that um, they still are like, wow, I can do this. You know, when they get an assignment back from me, and I always put smiley faces on there, I put a little comment, and they're like, wow, I've never gotten a smiley face before. You know? <laughs> so just a little smiley face. I taught second grade. That was what I was teaching on the streets. And I'm like, you know, people say, how is it teaching in the prison? And I'm like, it's no different than teaching second grade. You know, I, I use the same motivation.
animators, you know, I, I, I had, you know, putting a smiley face on the, on the paper and saying, well done, or, you know, or, you know, I have little stickers I put on, on their paper. So I put, they took the little smiley sticker and put it on their hat and they walk around the yard. <laughs> you know, so they're really no different um, than regular students. Um, in terms of technology, it is a bit of a challenge because, you know, just getting some of the basics done, uh, you know, done like how to operate the mouse, how to operate the mouse keypad, how to keyboard. So I'm really looking forward to doing some keyboarding with my students, you know, putting some of the stuff aside because when they do that GED tests, I have quite a few students who haven't passed the reading language arts course because they couldn't navigate the, the essay. They, they know how to use, write it, but they can't type it. So they always run out of time. And I try to coach them into, okay, visualize this because <laughs> We didn't have the computers to really to practice. Visualize it. You're going to get the laptop and you're going to have to type your essay. So don't write it on a piece of paper because they'll write the whole essay out by hand and then they try to type it and they're like this, you know? So, um, you know, and a lot of my prisoners have, or a lot of my students have been incarcerated 20 years, 20 more. You know, they've never seen a computer on the streets when they were out. So this is all really, really new for them. And some of them say, you know, I don't think I'm too, too old for this, or, you know. And I'm like, no, you're not. And then, you know, when you see them, I have my oldest um, GD student, he's 68 years old. Wow. And he wants nothing more than to earn his GD. And he was like, Miss V, that's what they call me, Miss V, I don't know, old man over here, I don't know how to use that mouse, you know? And so I can sit with him and say, look, look, he just moved it. <laughs> and now he can, I can and he did his first lesson on Aztec, and he was like, wow. He called himself old man. Old man, I can do it. You know, it's kind of really funny to see him. His name is Mr. Word. Um, and so they really are motivated. And I think that with the introduction of the technology, it's like it's going to really open up, you know, a new world for them. And it, it shows them too, we believe in you. Like, it's not just us saying that, you know, you can do this, you can do this. You know, so and 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 in terms of you know being able to enter back into you know real life after incarceration, I think this will give them the tools to really be able to function. You know, like how to do a job application, how to you know do a training program online, how to um, you know function in the real world on the streets. We call it on the streets. <laughs> So how often do you hear educators talk about when they were on the street? <laughs> Such an odd, odd term. Um, our next presenter will be on a video. She is from our uh, enterprise information system. I got it right that time. Uh, again, our district is the whole state. And we're dealing with buildings that were never intended to deal with school and rehabilitation, they're, they're built to house people who want to leave. So lots of challenges. So this is Aaron, and Aaron is amazing. But Patrick is amazing. Hi, I'm Erin Case, IT manager with CDCR's Enterprise Information Services, Incarcerated Population and Community Solutions Team. I appreciate the opportunity to participate in DLAC and TDLS. I apologize, I cannot be there in person with all of you. Our team is responsible for collaboration, coordination, and project management when it comes to all education technology efforts for the department. As with all agencies, changes to our work environment leading to 100% telework has changed the way in which we conduct business. Let's discuss some of the efforts and issues currently impacting our progress. In October 2022, we completed the Inmate Domain Redesign Project, which was a significant IT infrastructure effort requiring resources from multiple divisions within CDCR. The project team consisted of approximately 40 people with a capital expenditure of about $16 million. The goal was to significantly increase the number of incarcerated people participating in rehabilitative programs. 
the successful implementation of this effort allows for more than 30,000 incarcerated students to access the online curriculum and allows the environment to be expandable, able to support up to 1 million endpoint devices. We have deployed over 6,000 laptops to provide improved educational resources for face-to-face -face college students. Over the next 18 months, we will provide laptops for correspondence college students and evaluate providing to GED, high school diploma, and ABE 1, 2, and 3 students. This will be effective in providing technologically advanced tools for higher education of the justice involved. We are also providing laptops for instructors and providing interactive whiteboards for all instructors to use to enhance their teaching and the content provided. With the improved technology, we are working to provide more professional development and training for both instructors and students through electronic methods, reducing our overall output of printed paper products. We are working with several other divisions to provide wireless access in all areas within our institutions. This project has been hampered by supply chain issues, as well as competing department priorities, creating resource constraints. Taking information provided by DRP, we have identified the first 11 sites, which include bachelor program expansions for priority construction and installation of the wireless access points. Our team is small, consisting of only 12 people, including our chief, with support from local IT to handle on-site institutional activities. We do not have dedicated IT staff to manage inventory, evaluate potential breaches or breakage, or handle on-site issues without competing for resources for the rest of the institutional needs. As of today, our biggest concern is identifying and eliminating security breaches by incarcerated individuals who see an opportunity to circumvent security measures and violate policies for their own gain. Technology in the hands of the incarcerated poses unique concerns. We chose to provide an internal solution, which came with its own issues. We are working to identify physical security measures to apply to the laptops, as well as more stringent software security to alert IT, educational, and custodial staff of the breaches and who is conducting them. Due to these security concerns, DRP is forced to take another look at the deployment schedule to determine what we can do to provide better security, inventory management, and investigative resources prior to handing laptops out to more incarcerated with less incentive to follow the rules and use the resources as intended. Security requirements limit the type of technology, hardware, and software we're allowed to provide and to use. For example, Chromebooks are considered disallowable hardware for incarcerated students, and Google Docs is not approved for staff use. The security measures put in place to enhance public safety and promote successful reintegration through education, treatment, and active participation in rehabilitative and restorative justice programs can also create roadblocks for educators, students, and IT. We have to be creative in our solutioning and focus on the business on providing specific needs and not the name brand solution they think will solve their problems. It is the mission of EIS to be the catalyst that drives transformation across this department. EIS leverages technology, innovation, and process improvement to support the security, safety, rehabilitation, and efficiencies needed for a safer California through correctional excellence. We are working in a collaborative manner with executive leadership directing priority of efforts, technological method of delivery, and funding sources. In addition to laptops, we are deploying tablets to all incarcerated people statewide in all institutions and fire camps. These tablets are intended to provide incarcerated people with enhanced communication and entertainment, as well as rehabilitative resources. The tablets allow incarcerated people access to incoming and outgoing electronic mail, outgoing telephone and video calls, incoming video messages and photos. Additional users have access to ebooks, audiobooks, podcasts, FM radio, movie and music subscriptions, department materials, and mental health and rehabilitative resources. We are working on a list of nearly 50 requests for more access and content. By providing resources through multiple methods and for all incarcerated people to access, 
we are able to decrease incarcerated violations, recidivism, and generational incarceration to increase opportunities for higher education, work experience, and preparation for life outside the institution. We are providing opportunities to develop skills and abilities for the incarcerated population, leading to a more successful retention of their freedoms and reduced societal impact from criminal activity and incarceration. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Erin. <laughs> and now, our queen, our leader. I'm just here to wrap it up, bring it home. Um, really quickly, Patrick, can you go back to um, either your slide or John's slide where we have a picture of one of our institutions? Yes. So my part of the, the, this to wrap it up is to talk about where we're going. I think it's important to go back to where we are and where we've been and how we got here. So our keynote speaker presented a list of things yesterday of how our students succeed. What do they need to be successful, right? And it listed a number of things, support from their family and their schools. And, and as she went through that list, it struck me. And I leaned over to my partner in crime here and I said, if they don't get those things, she asked, what happens if they don't get these things? And I leaned over and I said, they come to us. That's how this works, right? That's that school to prison pipeline that is so talked about. So how do they get here? What you can't see in this picture is that I'm clearly- It's your person. magnetic personality no, right. here. What you can't see in the picture, there's my little red mark, is there is what we call an LEF. In our business, we talk about the LEF a lot. It's a lethal electrified fence, lethal. It goes around that, and as Patrick said, to get inside, to get to us, it takes a lot of work. So they've come to us because they lack the things that they need to be successful. They've come through that pipeline. And when I came into my first role, which was at a prison as a principal, I walked on the yard, and having spent a number of years in public education, my first thought was, this is what we've done. This is what we've done by not providing the right things in the right ways. And one of those right things in the 21st century is access to technology that will allow them to be successful. And it's not, we can't say it's, you know, oh, we can point to the exact cause, but this perfect storm comes together for most of our residents that just, it shuts doors for them before they even know they exist. So where are we going? Where is CDCR intending to go with our education? Well, we're going to take the school to prison pipeline and change it to what I term the prison to profession pipeline. Not just a job. You give a guy a job, he doesn't like it, he goes and he finds something to fill the gap. You give him a profession, you give him a skill, and you give him the ability to feel proud about what he's doing, he's never coming back to us. He's got many more things to do on the outside. But you can't do that. You can go forward to my slide, please. Yes. <laughs> You can't do that unless you set them up for success. And our teachers are doing exactly that. And they have been doing that for groups like this with golf pencils and paper for years. And now they're getting their computers and they're starting to give them these access skills, if you will. But we have still large holes in what we're doing. Patrick works on what we call our e-learning, which provides skills that we aren't addressing in class. Just before you all walked in here, he and John were talking about a wealth building course. How do you teach an individual who didn't have any means of generating their own income other than criminal activity to actually understand what it means to build wealth and find success? These guys stood here in five minutes and germinated that course that will be provided through Canvas eventually to any student who wants to get it. We are headed in the near term to a point where our institutions are covered with wireless in-housing units so that they can take those passions that they have for learning and the time that they have for learning and extend it beyond the two hours a day that they can spend with us or if they're in CTE, their six hour day. They want to, they are passionate, they ask all the time. You saw the gentleman sitting on the side of the wall. That's not a staged photo, that happens all over. At this point, they'll carry their, their laptops until they watch Canvas catch. So in our institutions, they have a laptop 
it was very limited. It was not intended to do anything other than to be um, a thin client to reach the cloud. But because of some changes after COVID, it now has to have a live signal in a place that doesn't exist right now. That system is no longer available. So they'll walk around. They can't see. We don't have the, you've connected. You know, here's your wireless strength. They or the Starbucks that. sign. To tell oh, you yes, so, so they use the Starbucks model simply by carrying it and waiting until Canvas starts to move. And then, oh, I'm going to sit right here until that stops. And then once there are more guys on inside that classroom and my signal's weaker, I'm going to move closer. And they are that to get this done. It's amazing to watch. So we are going forward with, as Aaron has mentioned, more wireless. We're hardwiring the first 11 institutions. Our plan was to have it done in 18 months for all our institutions. Budget limitations and supply chain, it's going to take a little longer, but we're going to get there. We're also heading into an area where we're going to use more online educational resources. We have a process called whitelisting. And what that means is from the teacher to their administrator, to EIS, to me, to people above me, it takes that many people signing a piece of paper saying this is a worthy site and it's a secure site and the student can have it. We'll give them access. Well, you can imagine that bureaucracy, that wheel is slower than you know trying to roll a rock uphill. We're trying to streamline that process and have more online educational resources that we can get into the hands of our students when they've got that device, when they can log in from their day room, sit around, do whatever they want, watch videos, and have access to. Um, just yesterday, I had a fantastic conversation with the Aztec people about getting their e-hubs right on our computers, right? And on those tablets that shall not be named. <laughs> As, as Aaron mentioned, 50 requests for putting things on the tablets. The vast majority of those requests are not the entertainment stuff. They want education. They want to be able, can I get to my college? Can I get, can I take classes on this tablet? Can I get my textbook? So I'm not trying to carry around 15 different things. Can I, it's all that type of request. Now on the other side that education doesn't cover, it is the substance abuse, uh, mental health supports. We're putting mental health supports on those tablets so that those late night, let's be, let's be realistic, the late night, I need drugs, I need a fix, and I can get it in this prison, and I know it, can, are being replaced with, I can get on this tablet and remind myself of my coping skills, remind myself that I can not to do that. Our philosophy is the busier we keep them, the less they have time for stuff like that. So we are prioritizing putting a vast library of things on the tablets that are available to our general population. The reality is with 13,000 students currently, there are multitudes more than our wait lists for us. So where are we going? We're expanding the ability to deliver some blended learning, some e-learning, some online activities to bridge the gap until they can get into one of our formal programs. Now, beyond that, we have this visionary in charge of our department, uh, Dr. Grant Choate, and he runs around the world dropping what we call CBIs. <laughs> Crazy Grant ideas. <laughs> <laughs> he knows it, he embraces it, but he is like the hit and run guy on the freeway, right? He'll walk past you and say, that's a great tool, make it happen, and then he leaves. And until recently, 17 months ago, <laughs> those ideas were dropped in various gardens and they started sprouting and getting roots in different places, but there wasn't a way to benefit. If we're growing strawberries here and strawberries there and you've got a fertilizer and I don't, you're going to get two different results. So in one of his crazy brand idea moments, I think, he had an idea that they needed an ad tech person to sort of start to correct all of this and make it happen. And that's how I ended up here. So Dr. Chote and I have talked about things like virtual reality headsets, right? How do you teach someone the world if they're in the middle of an LEF? How do you inspire a guy, like Ms. Lee said, who's going to be with us for the rest of his life to have any sort of passion for doing something other than fair, in, inside crime, or nothing, right? We want to inspire him. Because there's never, in California at least, there's, ne there's a never say never attitude. One of my very close associates 
runs an internal program for uh, therapy dogs. He was the first person sentenced to multiple life sentences without possibility under the three strikes law in California. As he'll tell you, I wasn't a bad dude. I was just multiply kind of awful. And I ended up here for 190 years. What kind of inspiration can you have facing 190 years? His inspiration came from dogs. His inspiration got him to the point where the governor signed a first order to get him out. 13 years, his 190 went to go home and make life. No skills, nothing other than his passion for dogs. He runs our programs in prison, not for dogs. But there's a never say never attitude. If he can get out, so can everyone else. And it's our responsibility to make sure we send them away with the best possible chance. To do that, they need to be able to get online and fill out applications. They need to understand social services. They need to have a connection with adult education on the outside because many of them are going to leave us before they finish that GED. They, we need to strengthen that bond to say, oh, you're going to Placer County? Here are some resources. Reach out to them. And in that spirit, we started early conversations of providing a tablet of sorts that will enable them to continue having access to specific resources for 30, 60, 90 days, whatever it is. It's still in a very crazy idea stage. But instead of just handing them money that will be used and gone, we want to hand them something that says, we recognize you're probably going to be unstable for the first few months that you're out. We recognize that that's going to be the most critical period in your, am I going to recidivate or not? And we're going to give you this so that you can continue to find those resources. You can have internet access to apply for jobs. You can get a hold of any of the services that you need right there. And maybe some of those mental supports that we need, maybe we'll continue that as well, just to keep you going. So those early conversations are really where we're headed. We're trying to, again, change the dynamic of our students can succeed, maybe. <laughs> to our students will succeed. And not only will they succeed, but they're gonna thrive. They're gonna go out prison to profession and we're going to be inviting them to come back and stand up next to us and talk to you guys next time because we do that at some of our conferences and tell you what role technology played for them in being successful. Because as Patrick has pointed out, there are ways to put together virtual ATM machines, virtual services on the web. Nothing is impossible. And thankfully for us, we have a leader who really honestly believes that and amazing folks who are like, that's an idea I can make happen. So that's where we're headed. I hope that you've gotten some uh, insight into what we do and what these guys do. I don't do anything except listen to what they ask and go make it happen. So my job is just with the fertilizer and strawberries. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? Uh, you want to write that name? I do. With a bunch of letters. What do you have? Uh, so just a little deeper on Achieve 3000. So uh, Achieve 3000, um, is, are, you, are they doing diploma coursework in there, or is it more remediation for um, like English and math skills? So in the sites that I've been associated with, we just got the Achieve up and running. We have Cyber High for our high school diploma program. Cyber High. Okay. It's at the first time. Yes. Yes. And yes. they really are looking at the at risk throughout the state yes. and trying to incorporate everybody into that. Okay. Um, we, uh, most of the staff that I know uses NS Tech. And then in the lower levels, the Reading Horizons and the Achieve is just starting, you know, Spark 3000 is just starting to come into its own. Mm -hmm. um, so we use it for remediation. Mm -hmm. um, depending on where you are in the Reading Horizons environment or the Aztec, it's just one or three choices. When I say we have a lot of resources, mm -hmm. we have a lot of breadth, and the only depth I know of are Reading Horizons and Aztec currently, but we are starting to work on the others. So I'll throw some out. Um, 
listening to you talk and just talking about the, the literacy, the digital literacy. So we're incorporating uh, North Star Torrance. So we signed up with O10 to become a North Star agency. And I just, I heard listening to you and I don't know how your plan is going, site plan, but it was just, you sounded so right to implement North Star. I wrote it into the part of the oh, plan. Awesome, yeah. awesome. I think it's really cool. And so on a personal level, so my wife has a cousin who just got out after you know, 28 years. And um, we've been out for almost you know, four, almost five years now. But it, we spent uh, a good amount of time with them. They kind of grew up together when they were very young. And just, uh, just watching him come back. So he did uh, connect with some organizations in, uh, in the area to just kind of have those basic supports. And um, I know he got his diploma while he was inside, um, but um, he didn't do college work. And he did enroll in a community college when he got out. And I just remember, you know, he did have this deep struggle, you know, trying to connect, you know, online. And, and there's just the online interface and this um, just, and also, this is going to make it real simple, but I'm going to say simple as keyboarding, yes. you know, just his ability yeah. to type. Um, and I was like, man, if he's just, I feel like he just kind of had that stronger digital literacy piece. He may have had it very smart, well read. You probably know, read so many books, you know, while he was there. Just a real interesting piece. So I just kind of just wanted to share back to you guys. I think you're doing great. Thank you. And it's very inspirational. Thanks. It, it, it's, it's always been an interesting thing for me talking to students who have been in. The system, there was a man I dealt with, he was 49, getting ready to go home. And he'd been in the system since he was 13. Yeah. And he had no concept of, you know, I'm going to go to a movie. I'll just get a newspaper. Sorry, dude. <laughs> I need to call my grandma. I'll just go to the pay phone. Mm -hmm. Sorry, dude. I mean, yeah, it, it, it's, it, and so what you're talking about I'm hearing strongly, they need to know things like keyboarding. We we move from giving them $200 to a card mm -hmm. when they get out. That was a paradigm shift. What do I do with this card? Mm -hmm. so, some things just like yeah. wealth so management, I, money management, right. you know, and so have, society has changed so much, you know, for somebody who just really hasn't been integrated and just all the stories he would share about being inside. About yeah. Those things you guys already know, all those things that happen inside or, you know, just things that were commodities and, you know, mm -hmm. how they could make, if there was anything that could be reshaped into something and used okay. for something that could create, create the my, best chefs from the simplest. <laughs> my clerk, uh, when I was at a site, uh, was the first to pilot the video visiting during COVID. Now that, if you want to talk about something that he had been down 28 years at that point. Um, and so just the video visiting, they have cell phones so they know that you can do that. But just the fact that now, as opposed to someone coming in his environment and sitting in a room like this, where they can sit across the table, now he's in someone else's environment, group release, right? So he comes back and he's sitting there and he's not really doing much this day after he piloted him. So it's kind of sitting in his thoughts. And I said, hey, you know, what's up? He said, I piloted the video, video visiting yesterday. I said, how'd that go? He's like, I got to see the inside of my sister's house. Huh. And she had been a, a child the last time he'd seen her. And he, I, I absolutely really, I just, this guy was great, very, very great personality. He's sitting there and he looks at me and he goes, she walked me around her house. And I'm wondering why this is a problem for him. And I'm like, well, was there something wrong with her house? Or he goes, did you know some people have two ovens? Two, two ovens. She opened them. They were both real working ovens. Did you know people have two ovens? Yeah, what that happen? <laughs> and you can just see on his face, he realized it's fine, right? Mm -hmm. Suddenly now, that hit him in the face. The time has passed while I've been here. Stuck, stagnant. And his implied message to me was, you have to help me because I'm not ready for that. Yeah. If I'm not ready for two ovens, I am not ready for not having a bus schedule that I pull out of my back pocket and flip open. I'm yep. not ready. Ryan points out some uh, 
some things we, we don't talk about here. There's a lot of dark humor, gallows humor, if you will. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The funny stories on the inside, if I tried to tell those at a party at night, <laughs> they wouldn't think that was very funny. But I would look around and go, well, this is a reality for some people. I had clerks also get out after 27 and 37 years in education isn't just to get the GED. They don't know how to speak to the board. They don't know how to speak to an officer. They have to code switch. They have to be able to understand and they can learn it in Canvas. We can help them in so many ways. In the virtual reality, I, I was in a program and there was, uh, there was a welding program they never had a stick of metal in their hand. It was all virtual. And they came out with four certificates out of the five. Mm -hmm. And they, they could make $80, $90 an hour when they got out. Um, and all they had to do is go get the aluminum cert on the outside that you couldn't do virtually. And these guys were like, okay, so teach. This is what they call you. Teach, what do I do? I said, well, can I go get a small business loan? You're going to get a van. You're going to figure out who needs you, know, you to work for them. And if you can do those things, you'll never come back and see me again. And they go, I have no idea how to do those things. So much of our GED, you should see people, they will fail the GED occasionally because they're not done learning from you yet. Mm -hmm. So in my class, we talk about real world situations. The funny thing is, hey, you're 46 years old. You got to go to the doctor. Bad things are going to happen. You get two months worth of medicine. What are you going to do? And then the look on their face like, what do you mean, what am I going to do? I, I go down the med line and they give me no, no, right? No, we're over time. So, oh, sorry, so we're over. Thank you, folks.